Let me add my huge thanks for everybody for joining us today. We actually, it's been a while since we were last together. Uh, I was reminded it was actually 2019. So a huge thank you for those thousand people that plus that are in the room, but also because the world has gone digital. Uh, there are 10,000 more watching the live stream with us today and tomorrow. So a huge, huge thank you for joining us. A ton's happened since we were last year together, and I thought it might be useful just to spend a minute to reflect on how far we've come. This November will actually mark 10 years since HydroCorp's founding. So in November 2012, uh, this is when this all began. What we've done together is actually kind of amazing. Uh, and it's not just us, it's the people in our community, it's our employees, it's our partners that have helped position our company as this kind of core enabling force inside the cloud ecosystem. Thank you to all of you for supporting us over that 10 year period, because I know, I know many of you have been here since the beginning. Some of the highlights that jump to mind, if you actually look at the pace of engagement with us, we actually have not only seen downloads of more than 250 million uh, of our products across eight different categories, those are being dropped into the Hotscore user group community of which we have like 155 around the world in 55 countries, which is kind of a remarkable commentary on the scale of engagement from all of you. When we started HashiCorp years ago, it was just a couple of products. Today, it is literally eight products, two of which you'll hear a bunch more about today, which is Waypoint and Boundary, which contributed to the download numbers you see on the, on the screen. We actually don't track the downloads, truthfully, all that closely. It's not what we're trying to do, but we know that from what we can see, there were 250 million downloads in, in just a single calendar year, which is kind of mind-numbing. We've also seen a huge lean-in from the ecosystem in terms of integrations. So Terraform alone has more than 2,000 providers. I tend to refresh registry.terraform.io all the time to see what's new. There are more, more than 2,000 Terraform providers in the ecosystem. They span not just the cloud estates like Amazon, Azure, Google, Alibaba, Oracle, what you, as you would expect. They also exist for traditional on-prem uh, infrastructure, things like vSphere, things like v vSAN, things like Palo Alto Networks and all the technologies that are critical to the private data center. And we've also increasingly seen Terraform providers be built around the SaaS ecosystem. So I run into people all the time that are using Terraform to configure and automate the onboarding of developers and GitHub, for example. What it speaks to is just the scale of, of sort of, sort of uh, standardization that we've seen around uh, the products in our portfolio, and that's being done by all of you. We actually have more than 500 cloud and technology partner integrations across more than 250 companies in our overall portfolio, which is kind of an amazing commentary on the power of open source. To make this all work within our growing customer base, we partner with a little over 400 uh, uh, called global system integrators or regional system integrators across the world, literally around the globe each and every day. These are the folks that are making companies successful in the adoption of our tech. That has helped us to have the privilege of partnering with almost 200 of the Fortune 500, which is kind of an unfathomable number when we started this, to consider how critical our tech is to the most important brands in the world. Some of those folks are here you, over the next couple of days, hear from people like Comcast, City National Bank, Snowflake, some really, really large companies, as they come up and share what they're doing with our tech to really automate their infrastructure estates. That's all done by our employees, which span, uh, I believe the number's two dozen countries around the globe. As a, as a remote company, this has been a huge advantage for us. We have employees in 2,000, so two dozen countries, more than 2,000, and that's what makes this all happen. And lastly, in December, we took the critical step of becoming a public company. This is an important milestone for us, largely because it allows us to provide transparency around the state of our company to those large, large organizations that are making really, really significant generational bets on us as a partner. So, I'd like to send my thanks to all of you for helping make this happen. It's been a really, really fun 10 years, and I look forward to the next 10. Being in this information flow is actually a real privilege. And I think, you know, Armand and I in particular get to spend our time traveling around the globe, learning from what you all are doing. And what we've heard is actually incredibly, incredibly consistent. What we see in terms of people's cloud adoption journeys is there's sort of a phase to it. Stage one, Someone says, hey, I need to build a new mobile banking application. Let's do that on Amazon or Azure. We sign up uh, an enterprise agreement with Amazon, and off we go. We assign some developers to start building that. You know, six months into the program, we've got 200 Amazon accounts. Our security team's freaked out by the fact that apps are being dropped into a, to a low-trust network perimeter. And our, and our networking team's probably just saying no to having those apps see traffic. 
It is during that period that our open source products are used, right? Probably more so even than the cloud native products in many cases because of the surface area of integration that's been accomplished that's helped standardize some of those core concepts. So Terraform Vault, Console, et cetera, are used in that phase one uh, part of the journey. Then invariably, someone has to bring it all under control. And you know whether we call it a cloud program or an SRE team or a DevOps team, the core point is a core team is assigned to bring some order to it. So we can say, hey, we're going to have 10 Amazon accounts, not 200. I, I'm going to stand up a, shared ser a, a, a standard shared service of, of Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise or Vault or Console and allow people to consume it. And in so doing, we can industrialize the application delivery process to cloud without getting in people's way. And I think this is one of the really cool things that we've done as a company is enable this model in an, indus in an industry. These are the things you don't really you know, set out to do, but when you observe it, you go, yeah, the fact that Terraform allows this producer-consumer model has given rise to this, to this notion of a platform team or a cloud program that could run a central shared service for everybody to consume. And that is the pattern. Around the globe, around every region, every geography, that's the journey that people are going through. And I think they're increasingly looking for prescription. I would argue that those folks here in the room, by and large, are owners of those platform teams inside your companies. Right? That's who you are. That is who our customer is. That platform team or its equivalent is our customer. The really neat thing for us is how that basic model not only applies to your cloud program, but for folks that have been going down this path for a while, is actually adopted on their on-premise state as well. Look no further than the proof of the registry where I looked the other day and I saw that the Terraform provider for vSphere, which is owned and, and maintained by VMware, by the way, um, has been downloaded six million times this year. <laughs> right? So what it tells us is actually not only is this model being applied to the public cloud, it's actually being applied to the, to the, to the private estate as well to enforce a common operating model across what is just the reality of people's estates. This has always underpinned our product philosophy. In case this wasn't clear, our open source products have always been designed to solve that V1 problem for the user, and our commercial products, because the Global 2000 asked us to do this a very, very long time ago, serve the needs of running those things as a central shared service for the company. That's the critical aspect of how our model works, and it's the balance of open source innovation that makes the market standardization happen for everybody, plus the ability to, 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 to commercially partner with the biggest companies on the planet, literally in the runtime path of their most important applications in their estates. I would say most companies that we engage with are somewhere between stage one and stage two of this journey. I think it just underscores how early this whole cloud thing really is. We actually did a, an annual state of cloud strategy survey with Forrester earlier this year, and you may have seen it because it kind of reinforced the same things that we see subjectively, but with data. What it told us is first and foremost, multi-cloud is the standard, whether by accident or by design, which I think Arlen and Mitchell co uh, coined a while ago, every company ends up in the multi-cloud reality. Why? Because different cloud providers have different personalities, they have different capabilities, and your companies want to be able to take advantage of that innovation. So every estate we engage with is multi-cloud. Point number two, 86% of them have, have cloud platform teams as the basis for how they interface to, the, to, to, to that estate, right? They call them different things. They don't necessarily call them the cloud program. There isn't necessarily one for the company, but there is one for the business group that's adopting cloud. In the biggest companies that are successfully adopting cloud, it gets standardized as a single team, but for most companies, it's actually it's early, early infancy and is really being done at the business group level. But there are some inhibitors. First and foremost is skills. Is that surprising? Skills is the number one inhibitor to cloud adoption? Well, no. Think back to the mainframe transition to the client server world. There just were not enough skills in the world of, of, of the client server world to match the need in the market. And this is just going to take some time to work through. Point number two is that 89% of them said security is the biggest driver of cloud success. Not surprisingly, it doesn't matter how fast you can spin up compute if your security team's not going to allow it to see traffic. So skills and security end up being two of the biggest constraints to the adoption of cloud overall, not Hashicorp products, but cloud overall. And that's why we've been investing where we have. What you've seen from us is a very, very deep investment in certifications. So our team has, has actually processed through our machinery over 25,000 certified Hashicorp cloud engineering uh, certifications over the last couple of years, which is indicative of our investment in trying to drive standardization into the industry for recognition uh, for how to actually badge yourself as a cloud competent uh, engineer. On the, on the skill side of it, we've always had a big investment in the, in the learning experience. If you recall, learn.hashicorp.com has been a huge part of our, our experience for a while. 
at Hotcha Coffee U, we, have, we announced that Waypoint and one of our other products was also available in, in what we call developer.hotchacorp.com. We call it dev. internally. I'm pleased to announce that today all of our products are available for guided learning paths on developer.hashigar.com, and you'll hear a lot more about that over the course of the next couple of days. We also heard in that survey that the majority are both implementing cloud platform teams and also the security was the biggest constraint. We've also heard that a consistent approach to security is the number one constraint to adopting a multi-cloud estate, and in practice, that cloud platform team is how this is getting done. If you have a common platform team to interface to the market, that is what enables you then to have a common approach to zero trust security. And this is why we're investing so deeply across the portfolio in the world of security. It all starts with identity as the foundation, right? Identity of machines and identity of people. And then number two, it's about the ability to encrypt traffic from one place to another across that hybrid estate. For us and for all of you, the cloud operating model is and always has been a zero trust model by default, right? Cloud is by default outside of your data center. So the cloud operating model is a zero trust model. And so the investments we're gonna hear about over the next couple of days are really just indicative of us lowering the bar for everybody to be able to drop that zero trust model across the private cloud and the public cloud estate. So let me hand things over to Arman to talk a little bit more about some of the announcements we're gonna make today. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Dave, and thank you all for joining us here. Super excited to be here. Super excited to have HashiConf back in the US after sort of a three-year hiatus. So great to see so many familiar faces. I certainly just walking around the hallways yesterday and today. I know a lot of you, this is probably second, third, fourth, fifth HashiConf for many of you. So excited to have you back and excited to see everybody. So, you know, thanks to Dave for kicking us off. I want to shift gears and go right away into talking about some of the product updates. Uh, as many of you know, we have a pretty broad portfolio, so I'm not going to try and talk about everything today. We're going to focus in on really the security and networking layers today. Uh, and then join us tomorrow. We're going to talk about the infrastructure and application layers then. So with that, you know, let's jump right in, right? Um, you know, I think, to, again, as I said, we'll start and talk about security and networking today. But, you know, I think before we do that, I almost want to set the stage a little bit as to how do we think about those layers, right? What's the problem space? How has sort of the challenge evolved around us? And I think that plays a big part in our product strategy and product thinking. If we kind of go back to the traditional data center, right, the way we think about and talk about our approach to security was very much what I'd call sort of a castle and moat approach, right? We had the four walls of our data center. We protected the traffic coming in over the front door. And it was a very IP-centric approach to security, right? We had firewalls. We thought about subnets. We thought about what CIDR blocks were sort of trusted and untrusted. And it was based on this idea that we had this sort of clear perimeter. The outside of our network was bad and untrusted. The inside of our network was confidential, secure, high trust, right? And of course, if it was a large enough network, hopefully we were doing some level of segmentation between you know, the development, staging, production, PCI fabric, right? So this was a very classic approach to network security based on this idea of a network perimeter, right? Now, you know, what's been changing is that our networks don't look like that anymore, right? Now they're much, much more complicated, right? And I think this is driven by a number of different things. One, obviously cloud, right? So now we have multiple cloud providers. We have multiple regions that we're operating in. Two, I think COVID dramatically accelerated, right, the move to bring your own device. People are working from anywhere. So this notion that I have a clear perimeter, you know, is rapidly disintegrating, right? There is no longer these sort of very clear four walls with static infrastructure and a clear point of ingress and egress for my traffic. Instead, it's this very complicated sort of sprawling estate where things are much, much more dynamic, right? I have applications in Kubernetes. They're auto-scaling. I have Lambda functions. They come and go. So trying to understand my estate through the notion of static IPs and having a sense of like where are things physically located is increasingly challenging, if not impossible, at scale, right? So our view is, okay, you have to actually take a different approach to security entirely, right? It's not a slight tweak to what we're doing. It's an entirely different paradigm, right? So I think for us, that really brings us to kind of the notion of zero trust, right? And I think, you know, in some sense, that means a lot of different things to, uh, to different people. I think, uh, you know, in some ways it's reminiscent to me of DevOps, you know, five, six, seven years ago where ask 10 people what DevOps is, 
you know, get 10 different answers. I think today, ask 10 people what zero trust is, get 12 different answers, right? So what does it mean for us? The way we think about it is it's fundamentally about saying, I don't trust you because you're on my network. My network doesn't imply that you're authenticated. It doesn't imply that you're authorized to do anything, right? Instead, what we're saying is you explicitly have to authenticate every user, every application, every device, and you have to have an authorization that says, what are you allowed to do, right? Now, the basis of that authentication and authorization for us is identity, right? And I think this is that paradigm shift that we're going through from thinking about IP as the unit of authentication and authorization. I had a firewall rule that said IP1 to IP2 to an identity-based rule that says, you know, Armand is a member of the development team. That identity gives him access to the set of web servers, right? That's a very different level of control based on logical user identity, logical service identity, right? So that's our view is that, okay, you have to shift the controls fundamentally to think about manage identity. Now, how do we make that actually work in practice? Well, that brings us to the portfolio and how we actually think about making that strategy, that paradigm shift real, right? So we talk about zero trust through this sort of a four pillar strategy, right? You know, for, you know, unfortunately, identity doesn't exist at the network layer, right? What you see at the network layer is source IP, destination IP, right? You got your, your classic network tuple. What you don't see is what's the identity of the application? What's the identity of the user? So the first part of our challenge is we actually have to establish identity, right? So this starts with first, you know, human identity, right? That's the first pillar or last pillar, depending on how you want to think about it. And that might be our classic approach to single sign-on, right? We have identity providers, might have been Active Directory or LDAP on-premise. You know, now it might be you know, Azure AD or Okta or Ping or some other provider in the cloud. But it's about a common user directory having some sort of cryptographic protocol that says, yep, this is Armand. He's a member of HashiCorp. He's part of the development team, right? So at the heart of it, it's about understanding and being able to understand human identity. Then on the other side, is machine or application identity. I'll kind of use machine and app interchangeably. But it's about that specific workload. How do I know, is this a web server? Is this my Redis cache? Is it a database? Is it service foo? I need to understand the identity of my application so then I can drive policy against that to say, oh yeah, you know, app foo is allowed to talk to the database, right? So it's about understanding application identity, and that's actually where we put Vault, right? And we'll talk about this more. People often think about Vault only as sort of a secret manager, certainly a key use case for it. But it starts with understanding app identity and then policy based on that. Once we know that, then great, we can start governing the flows around it, which is, okay, how do my different applications talk to one another? That might be north-south, right? I'm ingressing traffic. That might be east-west. I'm going web server to database, right? So there's a networking challenge highly connected to security. That's where console sits. And lastly, I have human access, right? I have a, my web developer needs to SSH into the production environment or my database admin needs to get to a database. So I have a human to machine access problem. That's boundary, right? So that's how we think about the four pillar strategy. Yes, these are independent products, you know, built separately, solving their own thing, but they're part of this larger story, which is how do we shift our approach to really a zero trust strategy and at the same time elevate to thinking about identity as the basis of those controls. So ultimately, even though these are all separate problems, they have to tightly integrate, right? Because these flows all happen you know, across these different boundaries, right? You're not sort of working in isolation. So yes, they're independent, but great. They all interconnect together in various ways, right? So if I'm talking about you know, saying my web service is allowed to talk to my database, console needs to understand the identity of the web service, identity of the database, so it has to interconnect with Vault and issue certificates. So Vault might be used as the PKI authority. Similarly, if my database admin wants to connect to the database, well, great, console knows where the database is and the identity of that, but Boundary needs to talk to maybe Okta to understand, are you a DBA? So you can see how Boundary then needs to integrate across to those different providers, whether it's console, vault, the SSO provider, et cetera. So these all are logically interconnected because they're part of a bigger strategy. Now, as we talk about that shift to managing identity, I think one of the first problems we start running into is that identity is highly fragmented, right? It doesn't exist necessarily in one central obvious place. In the same way our infrastructure is highly fragmented, so is our notion of identity, right? It exists across many different application platforms. So apps running in Kubernetes will have a different notion than apps running in Cloud Foundry, than apps running on a VM-based workload. Our user identity is fragmented across many different systems. And then you know, add cloud to that challenge, 
where Amazon's IAM is distinct from your Azure IAM, is distinct from Google, is distinct from Alley Cloud, et cetera, right? So it was within that context that we actually initially built and conceived of Vault, right? So it's actually, if we go all the way back to the first RFC we ever wrote for Vault internally, we called it Kerberos for Applications, right? If that doesn't mean anything to you and you don't know what Kerberos is, your life is blessed. I congratulate you. <laughs> but the challenge was really this notion of, great, these identities are highly fragmented. How do I manage it in a consistent way across all of that? So the first problem was, great, Vault needs to integrate with all of these different platforms so I can map that identity in regardless of where it's running and say, great, this is web service foo. Maybe that's based on the AD service credential on-prem. Maybe it's based on a Kubernetes service token. Maybe it's based on you know, my Amazon IAM identity. But now I understand that this is web service foo, right? So once I have that, then I can base policy around it and what it can do, secret management being sort of the obvious first use case. So with that, I want to go into some of the actual product updates, right? And since we're you know, starting here with Vault, let's, let's kind of dive in there. So more specifically, I want to start by talking about HCP Vault, right? So with Vault, we've been, you know, over the last year or two, really making a focused effort on bringing it and delivering it as a managed cloud service through HCP, HCP being the HashiCorp cloud platform. That's our chassis for delivering all of the HashiCorp products as a managed service, right? So as part of that, we're constantly looking at how do we lower the bar to operating this infrastructure at scale? You know, us delivering it as a managed service is a core part of that. So we started off with you know, maybe the more basic use cases around development clusters and single region production, and then over time have steadily expanded that to you know, multi-region capabilities, you know, enhanced enterprise features. So some of those improvements include you know, performance replication across multiple regions, um, multi-factor authentication, and a much expanded set of providers and plugins for Vault that are now validated, including the EKS support, LDAP, SSH, Mongo, Snowflake, and many others. Right? So as we think about kind of making that continuously easier, yes, part of it is about bringing more of the plugins, more of the integrations, more of the enterprise capability into the cloud, but it's also about supporting users wherever they're running, right? So we started this journey on AWS and initially focused on bringing HCP Vault out there, but it's clear to us that the demand is much, much broader than just AWS. So super excited to announce today that, you know, as part of that, we're bringing HCP Vault to Azure. So that's available today. Uh, it's now in public beta. You can kick the tires immediately. It's free to get started. Just sign in, and you can start provisioning an, a cluster on Azure. So let's take a super quick look at what does that actually look like. So much like our other products, starts by, you know, you log into your HCP dashboard, and once you go to Vault, you can go through the create cluster sort of flow, and you can see immediately now we have a choice between do we want this running on Amazon, do we want this running on Azure, and then we can continue through the flow, just like before, picking our different sizing, picking various sort of configurations for the cluster. And then eventually we can get to great, you know, create the cluster. And then this will go through the workflow, bring up our cluster within a few minutes, and great, we can see now it's up and running, manage it in exactly the same way we would have done on AWS. But now it's sort of fully managed, you know, and leave it to HashiCorp to deal with upgrades, backup, and sort of full lifecycle management of that. So super excited for this. Would love to get your feedback in public beta now. So go ahead and you know, kick the tires and let us know what feedback you have. Shifting gears a little bit to Vault Core, one of the areas that we've also been focused on is how do we think about data protection, right? So this is going beyond just Vault as a secret manager and really thinking about what role does Vault play to protect you know, keys, to help you encrypt data at rest, data in transit. And so one of the sort of areas where we've invested quite a bit is thinking about Vault as a software security manager, right? So, you know, as, a, as maybe contrasted with a hardware security module, where it's a physical hardware device you'd put in your data center, it's thinking about Vault as the software version of that. So a lot of work has gone into really making Vault aware of some of these key cryptographic protocols, whether it's, you know, KMIP, PKCS11, you know, some of these classic protocols that HSMs speak, so you can kind of bring it in and use it and manage it as software, where previously you had hardware devices. And then similarly, enhancements around bring your own key, whether you're using Vault to encrypt data or tokenize data, or to use it as a backend for managing your key custody within cloud-based KMS systems. And then enhancements to the PKI engine as well to support better key revocation and protocols like OCSP. 
Then as we think about the ecosystem around Vault, it's what are all the pieces that we can continue to integrate with. So Vault has a wide range of integrations today, whether it's classic database systems, message queue systems, caches, and much, much more beyond that. Right? We talked about Snowflake and Mongo just a minute ago. And so continuously looking at how do we expand that surface area of support. Right? So we are adding in the latest version support for Oracle's transparent disk encryption, so you can use Vault as the key manager behind Oracle systems as well as dynamic secrets for Redis across many different versions and distributions. So open source, Redis Enterprise, Amazon Elasticache, and more. So this allows us to have a just-in-time dynamic secret for Redis as well, right? So lots of, uh, lots of new updates around Vault. Super excited about that and continue to see a lot of momentum as people are really thinking about, great, how do we move from you know, secrets living everywhere to at least managing secrets centrally and assigning an application identity to then moving beyond static secrets into dynamic secrets and data protection use cases. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about console, right? So the next part within this sort of zero trust portfolio is great. We've established application identity. We can use that to then you know, do things like key management, secret management. But then how do we leverage application identity to actually automate some of our network access, right? This is north, south. This is east, west. So when we talk about console, there's four different use cases that we often talk about, right? I think the first thing where most people start with console is really service discovery, right? And it's acknowledging that, you know, in that same way our cloud landscape is now across all these different things, our application landscapes across many different platforms. So we have customers that span everything from mainframe to bare metal to VM to container to serverless to now WebAssembly, right? And I think that's the nature of infrastructure. It's not everything is running on one platform. Right? I think if the history of tech tells us anything, you know, turn the crank and we'll have two more platforms to support in the near future. And so the challenge becomes, how do you actually allow applications to interoperate across all of that? That's the first problem console sets out to solve, is to have a consistent way to do the discovery and networking across all of that. Then the next problem is, how do we secure all of this? Right? As we have application traffic going across clouds, across platforms, how do we normalize our approach to security controls and say, great, application foo is allowed to talk to you know, the database, foo might be in cloud, database might be on-prem, foo might be auto-scaling up and down, and I don't know what its IPs are. So that's really when we think about service mesh, it's really about up-leveling some of the security out of the network and into the application layer and enforcing it through mutual TLS, right? And of course, on top of that, once you're in that flow, you get observability, you get traffic shaping, you get all these other side effects. But for us, I think the core value is really thinking about how do you simplify and make consistent the approach to service-to-service -service security across all these platforms and clouds. Then the next piece of it is great. It'd be nice if we could snap our fingers and move everything into a service mesh world, but unfortunately we can't. And so how do we bring along the rest of our network with us, right? And so when we talk about network infrastructure automation, it's about how do we take that identity-based or dynamic approach to managing policy and bring it to where we have firewalls, load balancers, API gateways, you know, traditional network infrastructure that sits in between our applications and supports them. So rather than have to file a ticket and manually update a firewall, it's about how do we connect console and Terraform together to say, I'm going to define the policy of my firewall in an abstract way where I care about the services, right, foo and the service database. And as those things come and go, as they auto scale up and down, great, console provides that real time information, invokes Terraform, and we keep the network up to date without any manual ticketing process. Lastly is the API gateway challenge, which is as we go north south, how are we ingressing traffic? Whether it's into mesh, whether it's into sort of this you know, multi-platform environment, we need a consistent way of doing that. So those are kind of the key use cases for console. Now with that, I want to jump into some of the updates, uh, particularly around console 1.14, which is the latest version uh, you know, now in public beta. So one of the first major new capabilities that we're introducing is what we're calling cluster peering. If you've used console for a while, you know it's supported multiple data centers uh, since the 0.1, you know, so it's been many, many years but it's always supported it in an active secondary model, right? So you had one data center that was active, you had all the others that were sort of secondaries that were connected to it, and policy sort of flowed from the active to the other sites. And this made sense for a lot of configurations, particularly if you only had a limited number of data centers. But I think what we've continued to hear from people is they wanted more flexibility to have more complicated topologies. You know, what if I don't just have a star topology? What if I have or a hub and spoke? And I think the other challenge we've seen is in large enterprise settings, you might not have a single administrator of a mega console. Instead, each line of business or each application team may have their own console cluster with their own administrators, 
but they still want to allow traffic to flow between those different domains. So this is the problem cluster peering sets out to solve. Now each of these clusters can actually be their own active site. So instead of active secondary, they can be active active, and they don't have to be hub and spoke. It can be an arbitrary topology, right? So this allows different lines of business to maybe run their own or each application team to run their own console, but then still peer with each other and say, hey, great, my app team might need to share traffic with your app team. We should have a peering a rela relationship between us. This then allows us to also go one step deeper and delegate to the application teams their own namespace or you know, what we call an administrative partition within console. So teams can set their own policy, manage how they want to do traffic flow, do their own sort of configuration, allow traffic between you know, their own services. So pushing that down to the teams and giving them more autonomy, but then allowing that to happen across different data, say, data centers, right? So this enables more rich use cases, things like service failovers, where we can say, great, you know, app A maybe is trying to talk to app B within data center one, but if that's unavailable, we should do a failover and talk to service B in data center two, right? So this enables much richer types of functionality, whether it's around multi-data center topologies, service failovers, and delegation to teams. Then when we talk about console data planes, I think another piece of feedback we've gotten was how do we simplify the operation of console, particularly in environments like Kubernetes, where the underlying platform is already giving us a bunch of health checking, right? So console historically had you know, a rich gossip system and allowed it to detect failures of the underlying nodes and infrastructure, and that made sense when you're running it on bare metal, VMs, other environments where the underlying platform isn't providing health checking or that kind of failover, right? So console had to provide it. If we're running in Kubernetes, we can trust the platform to be doing that health checking for us. So it's an opportunity to actually simplify the way console works. So we're now introducing the notion of console data planes, which is a streamlined version of the console agent and envoy proxy. So they run as a single container and they skip out on the gossip protocol that console traditionally has. So this makes it much easier to operate, right? There's less overhead with console. You don't have to have bi-directional network communication with the gossip protocol. So it's much lighter weight, much simpler to operate, simpler life cycle, and it makes it easier to say, great, if I'm just running Kubernetes applications, I can connect that up to, for example, the HCP console environment and not have to do a complex network peering relationship, right? So a bunch of different improvements here really around simplicity, user experience, and flexibility of deployment. So we're super excited about that, and that's available as part of the 114. Next is when we talk about console, it's about that kind of multi-platform challenge, right? You know, in the same way customers started embracing Kubernetes and you know, serverless, Lambda is a key part of that. So earlier this year, we talked about a lot of the work to extend console onto ECS natively. Now we've also been focused on extending console into you know, Lambda environments as well. So this flows in two different directions. One is going from the mesh to Lambda. So I might have mesh-based applications that need to invoke Lambda functions. And we want to do that in a way that's consistent, secure. You know, we can kind of govern it through the same set of console policy. So that piece is going generally available today to allow that direction of traffic. Right? The other direction is also going into public beta, because I think that's equally important, which is I might have a next generation set of services that I'm building on Lambda as a serverless capability, but those need to call back into my existing services that maybe are VM-based or Kubernetes-based or bare metal-based. And so as I'm going from mesh back into, uh, I'm sorry, from Lambda back into the mesh, we need a secure way of doing that. So that's going into public beta today as well and gives us a consistent workflow to govern all of that regardless of which platform we're running on, right? So really enabling that kind of mix and match of infrastructure that we increasingly see, right? So pulling it back, right, as we talk about console 114, lots of improvements coming in, right? Some of the key highlights being cluster peering that we talked about, data planes, you know, ECS and Lambda support being much deeper, along with many smaller usability enhancements and quality of life improvements. So there'll be some great sessions going deeper on a bunch of that. Now, shifting gears a little bit, you know, and talking about the transition to HCP console, right, again, similar to Vault, the goal is how do we make it easier and lower the bar to operating this infrastructure at scale, right? So great, where we started with HCP console was can we deploy a cluster, can we make it easy to stand it up, manage that whole life cycle of backups, upgrades, you know, all that kind of good operational stuff. But I think the challenge we end up seeing is that over time, you actually don't have one console cluster, you have many, right? Either you're running them across multiple clouds, you're running them across multiple regions, you're running them for multiple different app teams. So over time, your problem is not how do I manage one, it's how do I manage many, right? And I think that's where the challenge starts to grow, right? It's multiple platforms, clouds, et cetera. 
And so when we think about sort of what we're trying to do with HCP console, it's not just operating a single cluster. It's how do I make it easier to operate all of my console infrastructure, all of my network infrastructure. So that's where we've been spending a lot of time thinking about, OK, how do we solve not just the control plane, but the management plane around that and make that simpler? So excited to share some of the updates around that and some of the work the team's been doing around really making that a simpler experience. So the goal is to really elevate HCP console to be a single unified management plane for all of your console services, right? So that's about a global catalog. It's about having a unified view and about making all that sort of magically hosted as part of running console. So let's take a quick look at what this looks like. So again, starting through the HTTP console, we still have the option we can launch a cloud-managed instance for, you know, that HashiCorp's responsible for, or you can actually bring your own self-managed console that you're already running, right? So in this sort of example, we'll work through the flow. You know, here we're going to get some examples of you know, how to bootstrap a console cluster running on a Kubernetes environment, right? But this could be a cluster that's running you know, that you already have. We want to enable you to bring that to cloud to really support that sort of hybrid management. In this case, we'll bring up this particular cluster on Kubernetes, and great, now we can see it's showing up within cloud, even though this is self-managed running in our own data center or in our own cloud environment, not managed by HashiCorp. But we still get visibility about you know, what are the versions it's running, are there any sort of issues that we detect, right? are we out of date? And then through the UI, we can still access the console UI. So even though it's through the cloud portal, this might be running on-prem, we still can understand what are the services, what's their health status, what, how is the cluster being configured, are there any sort of problems with it that we detect? And so again, this starts to enable HCP console to be that unified management plane across the cloud managed and self-managed, regardless of where those clusters are running, in kind of a consistent way, right? Now, where's the future vision of this going? That that we talked about will be available shortly. Where we want this to really get to is it's not just a management plane to let you view it, but actually configure and administer the console. So in this case, I might trigger a peering relationship between my US West and US East clusters, right? And so this will actually orchestrate the peering arrangement between those, right? Going back to some of the cluster peering that we just talked about. So now we're not just viewing things, we're actually managing a global fleet of clusters in a consistent way. Here we might say we're getting alert information or monitoring information around you know, versions or security issues that, are, you know, that we can discover over time. And then it's about pulling in that observability information and making it easy to understand, great, how is traffic flowing between these things? What's the status of my different services? So it's really meant to become not just for the operators who are running console, but really end users who are running their services to understand what's the status of my application across different clusters, different environments, you know, what's the health of all these things, right? So we're super, super excited about all of this work, you know, and this is all coming very, very soon in the next few weeks. So if you're interested, we'd love to get your feedback. This is going into private beta, you know, at the end of the month. So please sign up. We'd love to get your feedback and you know, participate in helping us shape the future of this as we better understand what are the workflows and challenges you all have. So please, you know, if you're interested, sign up, and we'd love to hear from you. Now I'd like to hand it over for just a minute um, to our friends at Comcast. We have Harmon Dillon, VP of Software Development uh, and Engineering from Comcast, to share their story about why they use, Comcast, why they use HashiCorp console, uh, as well as the broader parts of our portfolio. So I'm going to hand it over to him for just a few minutes. I'd like to thank HashiCorp for giving me an opportunity to speak as part of this conference. To introduce myself, I'm Harman Dhillon, Vice President for Software Development and Engineering at Comcast. Our team's vision is to create extensible, open ecosystem of integrated tools and capabilities to improve developer experience that allows them to focus on delivering business value. Now we help analyze developer pain points and then look at solving problems by creating undifferentiated products focused on the needs of the engineers. These are built from the ground up that are sometimes using open source or in some cases using off the shelf vendor products. Value we provide to the developers is abstracting away network, security, and other complexities associated with enterprise needs as we integrate the products and make them available to the developers as part of different phases of development journey. To name some of the tools and platforms we deliver to our engineering community, experimentation platform to run A-B tests, observability tools, to provide a single pane of glass view across metrics, 
logs and distributed traces, CI-CD platform for automating deployment pipelines end-to-end. -end. Related to the HashiCorp stack, we also develop integrated tools to help the engineering community on ease of developing microservices, whether new or moving from monolith architectures. So in this space, we've integrated Open Source Console with other tools in our portfolio to deliver a service mesh solution to the Comcast engineering community. We have fully automated the end-to-end -end deployment pipelines, both for deploying the infrastructure as well as onboarding of services. This in turn uses HashiCorp stack technologies like Terraform and Vault for secrets management. Our engineers are running several services using AWS Lambdas. So we are really excited about the GA announcement for being able to register a Lambda service as part of, the cons as part of console, connecting them for other mesh services. This further empowers our engineers and seamlessly bridges services deployed across various environments that are using virtual machines, containers, or higher level services like functions as a service. Now, uh, since we do not dictate a specific cloud where the engineers deploy services, we want to meet them where they are. Console-based service mesh infrastructure deployed in each of our supported public-private cloud environments, container-based workloads, et cetera, takes away the underlying complexity of deploying and configuring this infrastructure, ensuring all details related to networking and security are taken away which vary for each cloud environment. This in turn provides the engineers a modern service mesh solution where service to service communication becomes safe, easy to use and resilient. It relieves application developers from integrating, configuring and testing undifferentiated network behavior logic. Awesome, thank you so much to the Comcast folks and Harman for sharing that story. I think there's uh, actually a lot more content. If you want to, I'm curious how the, the Comcast folks are using console, they've actually talked about it quite a bit in depth. So lots of content to follow up on there. So lastly, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about boundary, sort of the final piece when we talk about our zero trust focus. We introduced boundary as an open source product almost two years ago in 2020 at HashiConf. And uh, it's been a lot of work since then as we sort of continue to mature and advance the product. But you know, before we talk about some of the updates, I want to talk about what is the problem we set out to solve, right? Again, and it goes back to this picture I shared earlier, which is what's the state of our modern networks? They're very, very complicated, right? Our applications are dynamic. We're sprawled across multiple different clouds. We have public and private environments. And so our traditional approaches, when we thought about how do we give users access to these things, were very much based on techniques like VPNs, SSH bastions, traditional privilege access management solutions. And all of those were very much molded around the idea of I'm giving a privileged user access to my high trust confidential network, right? And so very much, you know, and then we had to manage firewalls with static IPs, we had credentials and you know, things like that. And so again, as we go back to our philosophy of zero trust, this didn't feel right to us. It didn't sit right in terms of how do we move away from network access? How do we move away from managing static credentials, static IPs, to really thinking about a different way of managing and giving users remote access? So kind of rethinking this from first principles, we said, okay, well, what do we want it to look like, right? And I think that brings us to sort of, you know, the workflow that we designed with Boundary, which is obviously starts with a user, they want access to some system. Okay, great. Well, rather than have them have a separate set of username, password, or SSA certificate, or VPN certificate, we want them to just do a single sign-on with the identity they already have, right? So maybe that's Okta, maybe that's Azure AD, but bring whatever identity you have, and that should be how we establish the human identity. Then the next piece of it is, well, we don't want to manage a set of firewall rules or you know, IP level authorizations. Instead, we want a logical auth authorization around, great, Armand's a member of the development group. Development group has SSH access into these set of services. I want to define my authorization at a logical level, right? Not at a sort of network level or physical infrastructure level. Then beyond that, I want to be able to connect to all of these different services in sort of a dynamic way, right? I don't want to have to have sort of static rules, static credentials, static host names. So it's about integration with dynamic catalogs, whether that's through console, Kubernetes, cloud environments, right? And being aware of the sort of dynamic nature of the underlying infrastructure. 
And then I don't want to have to manage the static credentials for those things either, right? So I want to be able to integrate with systems like Vault so that those credentials can be sourced just in time in a dynamic way for those applications, right? And that way we can use Vault's ability to create a credential just in time, use that in a unique way to a session, and when the user disconnects, we revoke that credential, right? So all of that has been our focus with Boundary over the last two years, really focus on maturing the open source. We brought the Boundary service into public beta over the summer to really make that a lower bar in terms of getting started and having it as a managed service. So super, super excited today. The culmination of that is really HTTP Boundary is now generally available. So super excited. So I want to take a quick second just to walk through what does that actually look like with HCP Boundary, right? So not going to be a surprise, very similar. You're going to start through the HCP portal experience. And when we go in, we can log into the Boundary service here. Great. We can log in as our different sort of users and connect this to our various you know, IDP systems, right? So again, might be Okta, might be Azure AD. And we can see that we have an organization. We might be a member of multiple different organizations. Within that, you can see the workers that allow us different network access. So we might have multiple clouds, multiple regions we need access to. And within an organization, then we have multiple projects. That allows us to give different teams access to infrastructure and let them self-manage that. And now we can go in and see, great, there's credential stores. We can manage credentials in either static or dynamic ways with Vault. And then our targets are ultimately the authorizations. That allows us to say, you know, which group of users has access to what. So here we're going to create a new target that's going to give SSH access to a particular set of, in this case, uh, access points maybe running on premise. And so what we need to associate with that target is what are the set of hosts that I have access to? In this case, we're going to provide a static host set. That might be dynamically managed through Terraform. It might be sourced through console or Kubernetes. And I'm going to associate the credential that we need. Right? Could be a static credential or a dynamic one coming from Vault. And so we set up this target, which enables that authorization for the user. So from the user interface now, we can see the user does a refresh. They can see they have access. They push one button, and great, they're now connected all the way through. So in this case, they're prompted, great, if you SSH to this local host, the local boundary proxy has established a connection all the way from their client through the gateway to the target device, and they'll be able to do SSH without needing to know what the password or the key is. That's being dynamically sourced from Vault. Right? So we can see the user experience is designed to be very, very simple, right? They see a, a list of what they have access to. They push a button, and they're securely connected end to end. You know, it's pretty brain dead for the user. And from an administrator's perspective, what we're really thinking about is what are those logical targets? I don't have to care about what was the firewall rule, what were the IP addresses, how do I keep up with it as it's dynamically managed. I define that logical rule and then keep that up to date even though we have a highly dynamic infrastructure, right? So a whole lot of complexity captured in a very short demo here, but super excited about all the progress here. I'm very excited to make you know, Boundary commercially available today. So you know, as I mentioned, HCP Boundary is now available. You can sign up for it on cloud today. It's free to get started. Super excited to get all of your feedback on it. So pulling it back out, right, as we talk about the broader portfolio and zero trust, again, for us, it's the view that we have to shift away from an IP-centric view to really an identity-based view of managing these things. That brings the sort of four-pillar strategy around how do we establish that identity, both application, machine, human, and then how do we use those identities to govern either the networking flows, north, south, east, and west, or the human access flows as we provide our users remote access into these systems. So super excited that you know, as of today, all of these products are now generally available and delivered in, as cloud. So you can consume all of this as a cloud service as part of our mission to make this more accessible, as well as self-manage for customers that aren't yet ready yet to have this stuff entirely cloud delivered. So thank you so much for joining for day one. We have a lot of great sessions and content following this. Join us day two for our infrastructure and application updates. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful MCs to share more about today's programming. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy the conference.